Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the right time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. Uh, coming up on this episode of The Right Time, something happened at the Army Navy game. Surprise is not like getting a little more attention. Uh, also, you guys have your stories about why you quit football. That's how we wrap up the year here. But first. All right. So. We have reached the point in things where we're starting to do our little coaching, sniffing around, seeing who's going to hire who. The colleges have, by and large, gone ahead and got all their hiring taken care of. And Urban Meyer still does not have a job at a college. I think a lot of people were surprised that um USC did not fire Clay Helton and hire Urban Meyer. I am more surprised that USC did not fire Clay Helton than I am that they did not hire Urban Meyer. Um, yeah, Gabe gets you a UCLA fan, so you gotta love this. Mo Clay Helton. Yeah, please, please hold on to Clay Helton. And then as a Texas fan, tried to hire their offensive coordinator away, and he said no. He said no. Okay, I want you to take a moment to think about this for a second. Most of us think that Clay Helton will not be there that long, even though he's back there for this year. And most times assistants want to go somewhere where they have some measure of security. You don't want to be there with your coach who's going to get fired the next year. And he looked at Tom Herman and said, nah, I think you look more like you're going to get fired next year. Graham Harrell, a Texas guy, right? Well, Texas Tech. But yeah, yeah, but like from Texas. Yeah, right? state of. That is correct. Although, to be fair to him, hey, man, um, I can see how you get out to L.A. and be like, man, what I'm going back to Texas for. Yeah, I'm signing a two, three year deal. Yeah, I'm out here making some bread, living the life, man. I still contend, man. If Kingsbury had wound up getting that offensive coordinator job in LA, he'd have never left. Can you imagine the life that Cliff Kingsbury would have been living in LA? How long would it have been before he got in a movie? Wh- which one is it that he looks like? Is it, uh, is it, is it, is it Ryan Gosling? Yeah, it's Ryan Gosling. Yo, all them do, like Ryan Gosling, Ryan Reynolds, and about 10 other people, they all the same person to me. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I got, I got no clue. I got no clue. But anyway, yeah, Herb did not take that USC job. And so here's the thing with Herb as it relates to a college job. He's going to get past any boosters that you got, right? Anybody that's in this for the winning part of it. He's going to get through that part of the process. I don't know if there are any university presidents left that would be okay with hiring Urban Meyer, unless we're talking about one of those like outright sociopathic type places that honestly, I don't think that Meyer would wind up working at. For example, if the Alabama coaching job came up, what happened with Urban at the end of you at Ohio State? They ain't going to be worried about that. They'll bring him in. Alabama doesn't have time to worry about those matters. The president of the University of Alabama knows that he does not have the clout that Paul Bryant Jr. has, and they'll bring in whoever it happens to be. Um, But I say, like, if Texas wound up moving on from Tom Herman, I don't think they could get Urban Meyer passed. I think there's a lot of boards of trustees and presidents that are looking around, and they're like, nah, man, we can't do this. This 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 can't be the life that we live. So he's not going to be there. So that means if Urban Meyer wants to coach again, and I don't know if he wants to coach again right now, but I feel pretty confident that at some point Urban Meyer will want to coach again. If he wants to coach again, it's probably going to have to be in the NFL. Now, I understand the general arguments that have been made about why you don't want to hire a college coach to work in the NFL as they are different worlds. Um, I also understand that the argument comes into play that in college, the coach has all the power, specifically has all the power over the players. And so it's different when you come into the league and now these guys are getting paid. Now, to be fair, given where Urban Meyer worked last, I don't feel confident saying definitively that he's never coached any players who got paid. Like, I can't can't say that like hardcore and they don't get paid as much. They get paid in the NFL. But I would not be surprised to find out that Urban Meyer has coached a guy or two who wound up getting paid. I can see it. Right. It's it's it's, it's visible. It's possible it's sort of thing that could have happened. So, you know, maybe that part is a little different. But, yeah, you know, the power dynamic is at play. All of those things there. But I really do think that there's something really to the idea of knowing how to run a program, knowing how to orchestrate a program, knowing good strategy when you do and do not see it. Because really the biggest difference for the guys that tend to be very successful 
in college and then come to the pros is that success in college is both caused by recruiting and then leads to better recruiting, which means that you are now doing this with better players than anybody else has. Yes. Now, where I think that people tend to mess up on that analysis, though, is all right. So Urban Meyer could go 12 and 0, 12 and 1, 12 and 2, you know, whatever, all these years at Ohio State. Now, that's not going to happen in the NFL. Nobody's going to have the talent gap that makes it a disappointment every time you lose. Nobody's going to be able to do that. But in the same way that you're not going to go 12 and 0 in the NFL a couple years in a row, you're also not going to get fired in the NFL for going eight and four. Eight and four in the NFL. I mean, obviously it's a 16 game season, but you get me. Eight and four in the NFL. Like that right there. That's a pretty good run, right? Like people are pretty okay with you if you go eight and four in the NFL. You can do that. And so a guy like Meyer, yeah, I think he could consistently put up pretty good teams. The stress would break him down. He'd be gone after two, you know, two, three years maybe or something like that. But I can see that happen. We've seen college coaches who have made this happen in one form or another. It becomes tricky also sometimes when we start trying to decide who is and is not a college coach. Um, Tom Coughlin, for example, the job he had before he took the job in Jacksonville was coaching at Boston College. He also had NFL time before that. Does that mean that Tom Coughlin is or is not a college coach. Pete Carroll worked as an assistant in college for many years. Then he worked as an NFL assistant. Then he washed out as an NFL coach, though he was better than he got credit for in his first couple runs as a coach. But he did that. Then he went to college and had all this success. And then he came back and coached in the NFL. So is Pete Carroll an NFL guy or is Pete Carroll a college guy? How do you, you know, like we're just looking for something easy and binary to go to when we start talking about this. My guess on Urban Meyer is, Urban Meyer is a really good football coach, um, much in the way that Nick Saban is a really good football coach. And I know it's easy to say, well, Nick Saban washed out in the pros. Nick Saban's first year in Miami, they went nine and seven. The next year, I want to say they went six and 10 or something like that. And then he decided to go back to Alabama. He was not wildly and terribly unsuccessful as an NFL coach. Now, I don't know how long it was going to work to see. Here's one thing about college coaches. And this is, I do think, an adjustment that you wind up having to make. They don't let nothing slide. Like my buddy Hayes Permar down in North Carolina made mentioned this to me once. I can't remember, or he couldn't remember who he heard saying this, but he heard somebody telling this story about Shashevsky when Shashevsky worked with the Dream Team in 1992, and that Shashevsky was talking to Chuck Daly, coach of the team at the time, and Chuck Daly had to explain to him, like, "Hey, these guys are professionals. You can't call every foul on them." Like not fouls in terms of refereeing, but in terms of like when they're doing something wrong or when they're not bringing to whatever it is, you can be on them for every little mistake in college. You can't do that with grownups. That's where the difference comes up in understanding that. And I feel like when I listen to Urban Meyer talk about things, I think that he's a dude that's bright enough to recognize that you can't. Right. I think that he's a dude that gets that dealing with these cats now that they got some bread and now that they grown ups is not the same thing as you can do when they're under your thumb. Um, and obviously not everybody gets that. Gabe, you've been paying any attention to what's going on with the Cleveland Cavaliers and John Beeline. He's basically in there kicking it like it's college. And them dudes are like, no, this is not college, right? You come into a 10 year veteran, uh, kicking it like Beeline's kicking. He's like, no, nah, man, you know, this ain't what we do. This ain't what we want. This ain't what we are about. I don't think that Urban Meyer would walk in. And have that sort of problem. Now, we saw Herb in the box uh, with your man Snyder in Washington. He was there. I mean, I believe this, by the way, that Terry McLaurin, his former player at Ohio State, invited him. Alex Smith, his former player at Utah, was there. You know, like, I, I could see why it is that he would be there. He didn't really ha- do any talking with Dan Snyder. So, like, yeah, I could see all of that being somewhat plausible. And I also don't think that if Urban Meyer is going to coach the NFL, that he's going to go in there and coach Washington. Now, the Cowboys. Ooh, 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 ooh. Now we're talking about something a little bit different. Could you see that one, Gabe? Could you see Jerry doing that? I could. I could. That's the big, splashy hire that you know he wants. So what's interesting about Jerry is... Jerry's first two hires with the Cowboys were really splashy. He's made three splashy hires, in fact. The first one was Jimmy Johnson, his former college teammate. The second one was Barry Switzer, um, his former college coach. 
Switzer was an assistant at Arkansas over both of those guys. Um, and then the third one was Bill Parcells. The other hires that he made, though, were decidedly nondescript. Um, he hired Chan Gailey. He hired Dave Campo. He hired Wade Phillips. And then he promoted Jason Garrett, and Jason Garrett has had that job now for 10 years. I think as much as Jerry would like a splash, I think Jerry just really wants to hire a really good coach. I do think that he cares about that. I do think that he wants to hire a really good coach. And I don't think that there would be a better coach if all we're talking about is coaching. I don't think that there would be a better coach available for him to hire than Urban Meyer. And so if you're Urban Meyer and it looks to you like the colleges aren't biting, and I'm trying to think the overlap between a college that Urban Meyer would be willing to work at and a college that will actually hire him. I'm not sure like what what the Venn diagram looks like on that one, right? A job that's big enough that he'd be willing to take, but a place that's actually willing to hire him given the baggage that comes with him. I'm not sure. I don't know, right? And if there's a danger for the Cowboys to speaking purely functionally in hiring Urban Meyer, what we've seen at these different stops that he's taken, and with some variance, but not, I mean, basically, the first coaching staff for Urban Meyer is always great. When those guys start leaving and he's got to replace them, that's when it starts getting tricky. You can go look that happened at Florida. That was a big thing that happened at Florida. That first staff was great. Then he started having to plug dudes in after the fact, and it got a little bit shaky. Like, that's where you look at him, and you're like, I don't know about this. And then that's before we get to the other thing. The other thing, obviously, being what happened with Zach Smith and the way that Urban Meyer handled it and what appeared to be some pretty transparent dishonesty um, about everything that happened with this assistant coach who was assaulting his wife. And it sure sounds like Urban Meyer knew what was going on. It sure sounds like his wife knew what was going on. And he feels like he handled it the right way. Urban Meyer appears to be the only person who feels like he handled that the right way. And the question becomes, how much should that matter when looking to hire Urban Meyer down the line? Um, To me, I think that as it relates to a college job, that should be a disqualifying factor. In college, college coach has way too much power. He has demonstrated that there's a level of trust that you need to have in him that he hasn't earned, that he does not deserve. You can't put him in that position, Um, partially for the morality of it, right? I mean, that's a significant part. But the other part is, as we saw happen with Ohio State, these kind of things mess up and blow up in front of everybody. Now we all look like fools. I wouldn't run the risk of that with him. I would not. I mean, now granted, he won two championships at Florida. He won a championship at Ohio State. I mean, those are jobs that other people can win at, too. You know, like the the only way the Urban Meyer experience is really a fair trade is if he is dominant. And so you got to make sure you got a school that has things in place that will allow him to be dominant. Maybe USC was one of those places. I don't know. But you would need him to be dominant in order for this thing to work. I don't really see that like being the case there. Now, in the NFL, can he get into the same trouble there? Can he do these things in the same way there? Like Art Bryles. Um, our brows down there. Coach, have you seen this? He down there coaching high school, and 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 it's looking shady in high school. Like it ain't supposed to be that important in high school. In the pros, though, with brows, the question I've raised is how much trouble could he really get you in? Like, there's levels of oversight that exist in the pros. So. Let's say Art Browse was your head coach. I probably wouldn't hire him to be a head coach, right? But offensive coordinator, if somebody said they were hiring Art Browse, you could talk me into it, right? I need to hear some things from him about it, but you could talk me into it. But if he's the head coach and some cat on the team is wilding and Art Browse finds out, the general manager, player personnel, there's an owner in place. There are all these people there who could come in and be like, nah, Art, we're not about to do that. Those things don't exist in college. Would there be enough oversight with levels of bureaucracy on a professional team that puts you in a position where you would feel okay with Urban Meyer, that he's not going to do something dastardly. Like, would you feel like you would have the things in place that could protect you from Urban Meyer's worst impulses? 
That would be the question I think you'd have to have if you were the Cowboys. And can we get this done in like three years? Because we know that Urban is probably going to burn out in five. Right? Again, the Cowboys have a lot of talent, but they're not going to have like the same level of talent that Florida had relative to the rest of America. Urban also went undefeated at uh, Utah and was pretty damn good at Bowling Green also. He's demonstrated that when he doesn't necessarily have all the best players, he can still do some pretty good work. But as much as we like to brand people morally and just decide this guy is good, is not good, should not get this job because he's good or not good, should get this job, you know, all that stuff that comes into play. If you're the Cowboys, you really got to look at it and you got to say to yourself, do we have enough in place to protect us from him? That's what you would have to ask. Problem is, Gabe, you tell me what you think about this. Jerry a little risky himself? That's totally fair. Right? Is that the guy that you should trust to be like, no, no, no. Someone here is, there's someone here to be responsible and that responsible person is me. Is that Jerry? No. Yeah. Yeah. So who in the hell is Jerry going to hire? Assuming they're going to fire Jason Garrett because I'm assuming they're going to, well, not fire, but his contract going to run out. Do we have any idea who he should hire? Sean McVay ain't got no friends left. Yeah, I'm really at a loss for like who the top candidates are going to be going into the offseason for head coaching jobs. People were talking about Greg Roman, the offensive coordinator yeah. in Baltimore, but I, he's not a Cowboys guy. No, but I'm also, I, honestly, I have no idea what he looks like. Like all I, I know of him as an idea, like as an offensive coordinator. I know his work, but I don't know anything about him. Think it's, of think of a meatball. Oh, okay. And then that you got it right there. Got it, got it. It's kind of wild that nobody's offered him a head coaching job before. Like the work he did with Alex Smith and Kaepernick, I guess Harbaugh got all the credit while it was going on in San Francisco. But the work he's done with them, the work he did with Tyrod, the work he's doing now, it's kind of wild to me that he's not at the top of people's list. Like, is that just me? No, I think like he was getting some shouts, but then it came back down to earth a little bit. And when things were going south with Cap, then it's like he washed out of the Niners situation a little bit. He went to Buffalo. Didn't seem like he got enough credit there. He got Tyrod to the Pro Bowl. There you go. You know, it's just when they fired Rex, they also fired him. Um but, like, go look at his offenses. All those offenses have been top-half offenses with quarterbacks that not that other people would not have necessarily trusted in the ways that he did. So, like, maybe that's the guy. I don't know. I mean, the idea of him with Prescott. Now, Prescott is more like Alex Smith than he is like those other guys, like Tyrod and, like, uh Lamar Jackson, right? Like, Prescott can move, but I don't look at Prescott. Like, Prescott is not Lamar Jackson. You know what I mean? Like Alex Smith can move, but I don't think of Alex Smith as like a dynamic athlete in the ways that Tyrod and um Lamar Jackson were. Like I don't think of him in that way. I don't know who the Cowboys gonna wind up getting. I just know they gotta get somebody, man. Your boy Jason Garrett be over there looking like I guess it looked better this week, but Jason Garrett just looks like there's nothing I can do. I can't even make a face about this. I'm just here. Why does he still have that job? When you said 10 years, he's been the coach for 10 years. Thought I was exaggerating? I thought you were exaggerating for a second. It's kind of like in the Terminator when uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's character is like slowly sinking into like the pit of magma. Mm -hmm. And he's like the robots like slowly melting. That's been Jason Garrett for like 10 years. (laughs) (laughs) Just like slowly melting, but not quite. Well, here's the thing. They've had a couple years in his tenure where they were really good, but none of us can point to anything that we think he does well. None of us. Not a single one of us. What is the Jason Garrett imprint on that team? None of us can point to it. None of us can see it. So, no, nah, I wouldn't be surprised Urban Meyer uh, winds up over there. And if it's not Urban Meyer, it's going to be some dude that we've never heard of and that will probably make jokes about if he loses his first two games. Either way, good for my business. All right, um, Army Navy was this weekend. Um, and Army Navy is, it's a football game that you watch, but not for the football. If it's a game that you are inclined to watch, this is for so many people what college football is supposed to be. It is the most idealized notion and idea of college football a bunch of guys who have dedicated themselves to something that is larger to themselves long-standing tradition and pageantry and all of these things and given that there are always great similarities between football and the military 
um, just in terms of the aesthetic. This fits perfectly for people. This is they joint. This is like nothing is more nostalgic for a college football fan than Army Navy on the weekend. And then you get the Heisman uh, ceremony that night. Uh, speaking of the Heisman ceremony, Gabe, did, 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 did you watch it? I cut the highlights. Yeah, I missed it this year. I'm trying to remember what I, oh, I went to a boxing match, so I wasn't able to see it this year, but I missed it this year. And I think a lot, a lot of people watch the Heisman to see the new guy become a Heisman winner. I watch the Heisman to see the old guys. Shout out to Billy Sims and Mike Rosia, George Rogers. We even looking at George Rogers and somebody be like, yo, I don't know if you heard, but that guy used to be a dynamic running back because he does not look like a dynamic running back. He looks like a dynamic running back's daddy. Um, like, like is it, that, that is my favorite part about that is watching the old cat daddies come back. Cause that's gotta be their favorite moment of the year. Come back like Mike Rozier. Ain't nobody think about Mike Rozier. Mike Rozier ran for 2000 yards in 1983. Ain't nobody think about Mike Rozier, but Mike Rozier show up there looking like cat daddy. I remember it every time, right? Like that's where I get my college football nostalgia. Guys in funny looking suits and Johnny Manziel, who should have something else to do, but you know, does not. Um, anyway. That is Nostalgia Weekend. And so it starts at Army Navy. And I don't know how many of you guys saw this, but Gabe, this was on game day, right? Yes, it was. So it's on game day, and some of the cadets are there. They're doing a stand-up shot. Um, you know, Reese uh, Davis is there, and he's talking, and they got the soldiers in the background, and they, you know, they whooping it up a little bit because it's game day. You got to have that passion, that energy. And then the next thing you know, um, a couple people – did that thing where they made a circle with their index finger and their thumb. And then they had the three fingers extended outside of it and they pointed it toward the camera. Now there are two ways for you to look at what happened in that moment. Way number one is that these gentlemen had done a hand sign that is associated with white supremacist movements. The other way to look at it is that they were doing something play, I mean, playing something called the circle game. And the way that the circle game works is that you do that thing, you make the circle with your fingers. And then if somebody looks at the circle, would you then like, like, like slap their hand or punch them in the arm or something like that? Is that how it goes? Yeah, something like that. Okay. And so what I have seen is that these young men did this circle thing on television. And people have made the argument on both sides. One, like, oh, my goodness, these guys at the Army-Navy game are putting on for the white supremacists. And the other argument is, no, silly rabbit, they were playing the circle game. Now, Gabe, I need you to help me out here in understanding this circle game thing because my people don't really engage in this activity in the same way. My people being non-military or something, I don't know. Anyway, um, so... According to the circle game, if you do the circle and somebody looks at you doing the circle, then they get to like slap your hand or punch in your arm or something like that. So if I'm watching the game, I'm watching on television and I see somebody do the circle. Like, does that person now have the right to go punch like three million people in the arm because they saw him do the circle on television? From what I remember from like my juvenile years, like middle school and below is what I like remember people doing this in. Mm. You do that sort of like sign and you put it on your like leg and yeah. you get yeah. the person next to you to look at it. Right. And they're looking like below the desk. Right. Right. So there's yeah, everything it's, it's, that's associated with It's basically with like that. looking at their crotch. Yeah. yeah. And then you get to punch them in the arm and that's how it works. Got you. And so what I'm saying here is for that game to work on television, that would mean that the person that I saw on television would have to come hit me in the arm for us to be playing the circle game. Does that make any sense to anybody? You understand what I'm saying? Like if he had been up there and he was doing it and he turned to the side and one of his homies got caught, that would make sense. Putting that on television does not make any sense whatsoever, right? The logic of what you're saying the person was doing doesn't hold up. As a result, we're then left to come back and ask ourselves, yo, were these cats on TV in their uniforms putting on white supremacists like is this what they were doing 
Now, this is awkward and uncomfortable for me because I have a pretty clear idea in my mind what happened. But because I operate with different stakes than folks on the street, I got to navigate this more delicately in terms of what I am and am not willing to definitively say took place. Right. So I'm going to do a measure of tiptoeing while making it clear to you what it is that I think went down. And I think it should be clear to you based on the fact that we just dismissed the whole logic of that stupid circle game. Right there. Anyway, whether that was meant to put on for white supremacists or not. How have we not seen a statement. From the United States Military Academy. Letting us know what went down. Like how is look if they were to put out a statement that said, come on, silly rabbit, they were playing the circle game. I wouldn't buy it, right? Like, I'd be like, yo, you must not have really asked them no hard questions. I wouldn't buy it, but at least you gave us something. They haven't given us a thing. Not a single thing. And look, man, that is a great big old problem. And this is why. While I talked about the Army-Navy game in the context of college football and tradition and all of those things, and, you know, absolutely something to that. Let me tell you what the Army-Navy game also is. It's a big old commercial for the military. And look, the military plays a whole lot of commercials during football games. I saw General um, John Henry, Henry, I don't know, you know, H-O-N-O-R-E, my man in New Orleans. Um, and he has made this point that they the military sees football. That is where they are going to find like the next class of great warriors is via football like that is where they try to reach people so army navy goes beyond simply being a celebration of the military in a very idyllic form it is also used to advertise it it's not just to celebrate it it is also to promote it and in the course of what is some of your biggest promotion that you have somebody did something two people in fact did something that looks like a signal of white supremacy. Yo, you got to come clear this up on one level or another. If they wanted to come out here and just say, no, nah, it wasn't even like that. Like, yo, you the military people will believe it. I'm not saying that people necessarily should under those circumstances, but they will if you just come out there and say it. And as far as I can tell, I've been looking. I haven't seen a statement yet. And I can't understand how in the world it is that anybody who was involved in that doesn't feel like that requires some clarification or some or if not clarification apology everybody just kept it moving and tried to act like that didn't happen how like how was that and look this isn't something that people don't really know about people have been doing this now for years all over the place right there's a camera shot on there long enough for not one person but for two people to have pulled it off They would have reacted much more strongly if somebody had pulled up their shirt and had written some message on their belly. Yo, you can't, we can't do that. Right? A great big old collective we. We can not do that. We can't. Like for me, that was so disturbing. Like just to look at and just to watch and to see it and that nobody that had any measure of power over the situation felt like it deserved some level of acknowledgement. And the reason it frustrated me so much is I spent so much time like trying to talk to people about racism and the things that happen that like people don't notice, like the subtle things that people don't get. And when you do that, people go so hard to, to like ignore the fact that racism can exist in any space, right? They'd rather ignore than anything else you know and so you sometimes got to slow walk them through things and then they may get there and be like oh damn i see what you're talking about now but whenever i get to talking about these things it's always oh you're reaching oh you see it in everything you know like these are the responses that i get from people hey man it looks like somebody just put that right in my face and when they put it right in my face they were wearing the uniform of what is ultimate authority in this country. Okay? This isn't just some random dude that's on the street. This is the person who I am told at every turn that I am have to respect on a certain level simply because they wear that uniform. 
And he did that right there in that uniform. And nobody has thought that it was worth saying something about. Nobody thought like, yo, you out here making us look bad. Like when my homeboys uh, were pre- pledged fraternities in college, one thing they always said was like, yeah, man, well, one thing we ain't going to do, like if we're going to go to strip club, we're not going to wear any of our paraphernalia to the strip club because that's going to make the organization look bad. This cat did that in the uniform of an organization that most people believe possesses a whole different level of new nobility and gravity. And nobody behind that uniform has felt like they needed to be like, hey, yeah, so we've talked at the very least. So we've talked to him. Right. Like one of them statements that you only put out about white dudes. Hey, we talked to him and we think that he's learned his lesson. You know, they ain't even bothered to give us that. It's just. Wow, that was an awful attempt at whistling. Anyway, just going to keep it moving. That's all it is. And that's insulting. And that is problematic. And that is daring somebody to do the same thing next year. Because you're demonstrated that you ain't going to say nothing about it. I just want to say this. Guys, we deserve better. Everybody involved in this deserves better than we received. And hopefully someone will bother to give us a basic explanation. And if they don't, I encourage everybody else to think about what exactly that means. We'll be back in a minute to talk about Tom Joyner and being black famous. But first, the holidays are here. This year, give yourself the gift of extra money in your pocket. Pay off your credit card balances and save with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. Roll your high interest credit card payments into just one payment at a lower fixed rate. Lightstream's credit card consolidation loans have rates as low as 5.95% APR with auto pay. You can save thousands in interest. Plus, there are absolutely no fees. No application fees, no origination fees, no transaction fees, no prepayment penalties. The application is so quick and easy, you can apply right from your phone. Lightstream believes that people with good credit deserve a better loan experience and that's exactly what they deliver now just for my listeners apply now to get a special interest rate discount the only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash bomani l-i-g-h-t-s-t-r-e-a-m dot com slash bomani subject to credit approval rate includes a 0.50 percent auto pay discount terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice visit lightstream.com slash bomani for more information All right, so, you know, via the Internet, uh, we learned that, uh, you know, white folks don't really know who Tom Joyner is. And I don't really blame them for that. Tom Joyner, for the white folks that don't know who Tom Joyner is, and I guess not all y'all white folks. I mean, I imagine there's some Latino folks and some Asians who don't know who Tom Joyner is either. So I don't want to make y'all feel left out. Uh, Tom Joyner hosted a syndicated morning show, the Tom Joyner Morning Show, for decades. Uh, the Tom Joyner Morning Show, in a lot of ways, is the basis for the particularly audio content that I have been providing to you guys for over a decade at this point. What I learned from the Tom Joyner Morning Show was the best way to serve a diverse audience is via commonality. Now, I understand that a lot of you were saying diverse audience. I mean, Tom Joyner did a show that was largely for black people. But if I learned anything from going to a black college, it was the heavy levels of diversity with in blackness right like diversity is not just simply a notion of race there are all kinds of different people who come from all kinds of different places within that arbitrary heading that we give people there is diversity um within the asian world there is diversity within white people there's diversity within latin people there's diversity within everything because people are coming from so many different places and so what i've always found about the tom joiner show was the common thing that they were talking about there was work. Like it's a morning show. Everybody's on the way to the job. And so that would be the kind of stuff they talked about. That's kind of a basis for a lot of shows, even if you don't like explicitly realize it. So uh Jim Rome doing midday sports radio, for example, that show got a whole lot of dudes that are out on sales calls listening to it. Right. Like you listen to Rome and Rome be under talking about uh the difference between the UPS man and the FedEx man. Because that's what the people who are out making moves at that time listening to sports radio can relate to, right? Like you find those little basic things that people can hold on to. And so that in a lot of ways is what Tom Joyner did. Like there was an emphasis also there, though, to like 
uh, a certain essentialist blackness that I don't necessarily subscribe to. So, like, there's a very heavy emphasis, I'd say, on church type stuff. And I, as someone who doesn't go to church, not really uh, so involved in that one. But that was a show that could appeal to people um, of different levels of class, of different levels of education, from different geographic areas, all of that stuff, right? Because you found what the common beat of life was, and that's what you want to do. And honestly, that helps me serve what I consider to be a diverse audience here in this place, in one place where we do have that diversity, I think, in the audience for this show, is a diversity of race, for example. But in the end, we all, like... You know, not all of y'all are dealing with this, like, you know, backbreaking levels of, you know, discrimination, oppression and stuff like that. Like, I don't know nothing about that. But on day to day life, man, we all living pretty commonly. The folly of race and how silly all that stuff is, is convincing people that they are that much different when they are so much more alike. And so from time, I really learned how to focus on the things that people have in common and then build your content around those contexts. Like, that's what I got from him. So. For me, like finding out the time show is going away, man, it is that was a show that was wildly influential on a lot of people. And then for black folks in particular, served an audience in a way that they were not being served anywhere else and putting on events and doing charity stuff that nobody else was doing. Right. I mean, that is an amazing one man operation. And I salute that dude on so many levels. And then we get to the fun fact, which is that white folks don't know nothing about who Tom Joyner was. Gabe, did you know anything about Tom Joyner for the weekend? I'm familiar with Tom Joyner as it relates to many times when people would come on his show and make news. Yes. So I'm, I'm familiar that he's a radio show host. I haven't listened to his program yes. personally, but I'm totally familiar with him. Yeah, like I wish people like one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life was on the Tom Joyner Morning Show when J. Anthony Brown was on there. Um, this is when American Idol had first got going. And J. Anthony Brown, this is, he's like, all right, so let me get this straight. So you saying that every week they have all these people, they come on there and sing, and then the least talented person has to go home? And they go, yeah. He's like, now how come Paula Abdul will be on there every damn week? <laughs> it's just <laughs> shade, That's shade. Such perfect shade. And by the way, at least as far as it comes to singing, absolutely 100% had a point. Had a point. But uh, anyway, I think it was Michael Harriet of The Root got on and he pushed this idea. He was like, who is the most black famous person? And what a black famous person is, the gap between how famous you are with black people and whether white people have any idea who you are. And see, this concept, I imagine, almost goes so far to not be fun with a lot of Latin folks, because like especially something that is like um, like, like Spanish speaking, then there's going to be like a giant gap. Like I remember when Selena died. I gave you were alive when Selena died, right? I am aware that Selena died. I'm just 95. <laughs> so, 95. Yes, I was alive. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. At least you, I mean, I didn't expect you to remember it, but, but, but yes. you were alive. Yes, I was alive. Okay. So look, I lived in Houston. Dude, Selena died and it was the biggest deal in the world. I swear to you, I had never heard of Selena. Like they started showing that clip of her, uh, in that burgundy suit at the, uh, at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. And I was like, Oh, okay. That's who you're talking about. But like, I didn't know who Selena was. Man, Selena was out there, uh, singing in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, right? Like I, I would have no gap. Like I imagine there's a big gap, like in a place like Houston where there's a, like Mexicans would know of a certain class of people, a certain group of people and other people, you know, other folks wouldn't like, I could see it in that way. So, you know, this gap does not only exist between black and white stuff. It's just funnier with black and white stuff, right? You know, less explanation required, but anyway, so we try to figure out what the gap is and Tom Joyner, that's a pretty big gap. I'd say that every black person in America knows who Tom Joyner is. I would guess maybe one in 10 white people know who Tom Joyner is. And I feel like I'm being pretty kind um, in saying one in 10 and to give you perspective on like what the difference is on that Tom Joyner and Howard Stern do not make the same kind of content, but Howard Stern is ubiquitous among white people in the way that Tom Joyner is ubiquitous among black people. Black people may not listen to Howard Stern. I mean, some do obviously, but either way, but black people know who Howard Stern is. White folks ain't got no clue who Tom Joyner is, right? It's a number of factors that can lead you into this sort of place. So the internet got to thinking about who the most black famous people were. And this was the one that threw me. John Legend participated in the thread. And John Legend said that at his wedding, by the way, listen to this flex. 
Gabe, did you see this part of the discussion? I did, I did. What an amazing flex. John Legend is like, yeah, so we're all at my wedding, you know, and he married um an Asian woman. And he's like, yeah, you know, um, we're at the wedding and Stevie Wonder had come and he just decided to sing uh, Ribbon in the Sky. Stevie Wonder just came to the wedding and decided to sing, Gabe. Yeah, no big deal. No big deal. No, 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 no big deal. No big deal. Stevie Wonder came to the wedding and decided to sing and he sang Ribbon in the Sky and he said that they looked around. And somehow, the white people had no idea what was going on. Like, for black people, it's like, oh, that's my <laughs> White people had no idea about Ribbon in the Sky. And I had no idea that white people had no idea about Ribbon in the Sky. And part of why I had no idea that white people did not know Ribbon in the Sky is that white people know the other Stevie Wonder songs. Like, look, the, the two singles before that were That Girl and Do I Do. Those were both hits on the pop charts. Ribbon in the Sky somehow did not cross over to white people. But, 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 y'all love I just called to say I love you. What kind of bull is that? You got a choice between Ribbon in the Sky and I just called to say I love you and you vote for I just called to say I love you? How could that be the decision that you guys made? Like the next time y'all have a meeting, y'all need to figure out how in the world such a thing slipped through the cracks. That is terrible. That is unforgivable. I just call to say I love you is one of the worst songs ever made. Ribbon in the Sky is perfect. It is absolutely perfect. I don't know what the hell y'all be singing at weddings. But anyway, somehow, white folks ain't really up on Ribbon in the Sky like that. Wow. And so that got me thinking as to how you get to some of these like concepts of black famous, uh, that, that we wind up here. Because basically what I think has gone down like with musicians is just the levels of segregation on the radio make it such that unless you got a song and it's real random what white folks gonna like, like a, like what a crossover hit's gonna wind up being, you can try to go find it, but it ain't that easy. You know, like after you got one, you can keep feeding them what they like, but until you figure it out, like it's, it's a little, it's a little difficult to pull that off. So, like, Gabe, are you familiar with Frankie Beverly and Mays? I've heard of Frankie Beverly. Was it over the weekend? <laughs> no, I've heard of his name before. Okay, it would have been okay if it was over the weekend, right? Yeah, like, I, like, I don't I don't know what he does. Oh, oh okay. That, I'm familiar with his name. All right, cool. That sums before. it up. That's good enough. So, like, I thought I, a lot of white people learned about Frankie Beverly over the weekend because he seems to be at the height of the notion of the black famous. So, Frankie Beverly is one of the greatest singers who ever lived. He uh, is in a band called Maze. Maze featuring Frankie Beverly. Um, are you familiar with the Before I Let Go on that live uh, that came on the Homecoming Beyonce album? Ooh, you might have to refresh me on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, Before I Let... Damn, this is so spelling out the point. <laughs> Uh, before I let go is the jail, right? There ain't nowhere you could go before I let go. Ain't more. Before I, black people love before I let go. White people have never heard before I let go. And again, how is this not a song that y'all jumped on? We, we are very confused by this. We do not understand how it is that you pick out the song that y'all gonna like. So anyway, Frankie Beverly got like six or seven albums that all went gold, but none of them went platinum. And if that ain't the most black famous thing you've ever heard, I don't know what is, right? Every single one of us apparently bought a copy, and now one white person found out that he even got released. That's where he is. Gabe, did you ever heard of Donny Hathaway? Who? Oh, man. See, I had Donny Hathaway as my vote on the Black Famous. Donny Hathaway, I'm not the biggest Donny Hathaway fan in the world, but I can acknowledge Donny Hathaway is one of the great singers of all time. There's somebody in every black family that does not just like Donny Hathaway, does not just have a Donny Hathaway album, loves Donny Hathaway, loves him. White folks ain't never heard of Donny Hathaway. He had two number one hits in the 70s with Roberta Flack. You know what they had him as? The dude that was with Roberta Flack. You fast forward to 2019, white folks still remember Roberta Flack. Black folks, we remember her, but they don't love her like they love Donny Hathaway. They just don't. It's crazy how that sort of thing winds up coming up. I was trying to think if there were some other people that kind of like uh fit this here description, where it's just like, damn. Like, there's always actors. Like, people pull out Clifton Powell. Like, Gabe, you know who Clifton Powell is. You just don't know who Clifton Powell is. How many of the Friday movies have you seen? I've seen them all. Okay. Pinky. Okay. Okay, got it. He's Clifton, but Clifton Powell just turns up in all the black movies. 
Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. You know what I mean? Like, like he's just one of those. It was a bunch of them. When I lived in L.A. and I used to, or Southern California rather, I used to live down there. I used to go to like movie screenings and stuff. Man, them dudes would just turn up everywhere, and I'd be like, "Damn, I don't know your name." Clifton Powell's kind of one of those dudes. Byron Allen, by the way, used to turn up all kinds of places, and I'd be like, "Damn, what's Byron Allen doing?" And little did I know, he was in the process of stacking up all the money. Um, so yeah, there'd be some actors that fall under those categories, but it's really musicians. But they ain't really. Like these days, it's not that many of them that white people just absolutely do not know, right? Like I'm trying to think the last time we cranked out a black celebrity that's like an actual celebrity that white people have never heard of. Like Gabe, you in on every secret now? Your forefathers didn't have this access to the internet and everything else. You, you know, you you probably know everybody there is to know. That's a pretty bold statement, but I'll take it. I think so. No, like there's nothing really stopping white folks from getting informed. Like, like, like yeah, no, nah, I just think. I think I think it's harder to come up with those people at this point where it's just like, damn, white people ain't got no idea who they are. Like sometimes you'll have it where it's just a matter of age, you know, like generation splits. But now y'all, are, we we I don't know if we've let y'all in on all the secrets or y'all just got in on all the secrets yourselves. Either way it goes, there will probably not be another Donny Hathaway. I think the last one was Gerald Levert. You know about Gerald Levert? Gerald Levert. Yeah, does not go. ring a bell. All good. He's been dead for a little while, but that's like the last one. Or it's like a singer that black folks are all about, and white folks are just like never heard of him. Not one. Gerald Levert had a top ten pop hit covering a country song, and y'all still don't know who he is. Come on, man, step your game up. We know you can't be on top of all the news and information of the day. No need for the social media feeds. We got you now. If you haven't heard. All right, Bo, this first story comes from music. This is Sean Grant from Negrio. Everyone from Kobe Bryant to Kevin Hart and Dr. Dre to Mary J. Blige were on hand to celebrate the 50th birthday of hip-hop icon Sean Diddy Combs. While every A-list name you could think of was in one room, all fans could do was focus on the interaction between Jay-Z and Kanye West. This is the first time the two rappers have been seen together publicly since their blow-up, when Kanye West called out not only the man who he once called his big brother, but also his superstar wife, Beyonce. Kanye's onstage rant that night was targeted toward Beyonce winning an award over him and concluded with himself saying to Jay-Z, I know you got killers, please don't send them at my head. A couple more back and forth instances in interviews and on music releases all lead to this moment for us to watch. Fans noticed in images where the two occupied the same space, Kanye would sometimes have a scowl and Jay would have an unbothered stale face or as some dubbed online, the face you make when you didn't ask who all gonna be there and you see an enemy. But there is also a glimmer of hope everyone wanted, the two Rockefeller icons shaking hands and cracking a laugh. Aside from trying to figure out if the beef between Kanye and Jay was over, fans also dived into the tribute from birthday boy Diddy to late Kim Porter. The big shindig was held on her 49th birthday, a month after his own. Diddy captioned a video of his late love with words can't express how much we miss you, but today is your birthday. We're celebrating you today. We love and miss you. Kim Porter died last year from low bar pneumonia. The two were together for over a decade, breaking up in 2007, but still co-parenting their children. You know what's interesting is that when like the Kanye J thing happened at first, it was everybody kind of got to pick a side. And the real thing that was going on is people was picking the side, the opposite of Kanye. And that's when people were still, you know, kind of rocking with Jay. But, you know, after that Kaepernick situation, Gabe, I feel like people looking at him like y'all deserve each other. Yeah, that has turned the tide quite a bit, hasn't it? <laughs> yes. it has. Ooh. We look at Ooh. both of them much differently than we did in 2016. Yeah, yeah, wow. A couple of th- <laughs> years have really made a difference for both of them, haven't they? Yes. If dude, Jay-Z looked like he wanted no parts of being around Kanye at all. None. Like, Kanye was just kind of, you know, and look, Kanye got room for beef. Kanye was just kind of like, nah, nah, you know, I'll do it, right? Like, I'll, I'll mix, I'll make it happen. Jay is totally, uh, shall we say, nonplussed. I don't even know if that's what nonplussed means, but I'm going to say it. All right, this next story comes from Health. Hey, this is Julia Reese. I recently wrote a story for Vice on a study out of Huazhong University in China, which found that people who sleep a lot are associated with a greater risk of having a stroke. Uh, to figure this out, researchers basically tracked over 31,000 people in China over six years, and they followed how much sleep they got and then whether or not they had a stroke during that time. At the end of the study, they found that people who typically slept over nine hours a night were linked to a 23% higher risk of stroke compared to people who slept around seven to eight hours a night. And then people who slept over nine hours a night and then also 
also took long midday naps that were 90 minutes or longer, so they're getting a ton of sleep. They were associated with an 85% higher risk of having a stroke, which is a huge jump from the 23%. A big thing to point out here is that it's not sleep itself that's causing people to have heart issues or a stroke. The researchers told me that we can't really rule that possibility out yet. Rather, what seems to be going on is that people who sleep a lot, one, they have higher cholesterol, which is a major risk factor for stroke, and then also they live a more sedentary lifestyle. This basically happens because long sleepers spend more time in bed, which then causes them to feel more exhausted and tired and groggy the next day, which means they're less likely to be active, and then they kind of get trapped in this cycle of sedentary behavior. So the key takeaway here is that while we don't really fully understand the connection between sleep and stroke, it's best to approach sleep in moderation because too much sleep and stroke seem to go hand in hand. Gabe, I got to say, I feel like um, Julia used a whole lot of words to say lazy. Uh, all, all I heard of that is lazy people have strokes. Yeah, I, when she said sedentary, that's what got me. I was like, Julia, I know what you mean yeah. when you say sedentary. These people are lazy. I mean, I don't know if they all lazy, right? But that's like, I just, I heard that and I just imagine my father being like, yep, laying in bed all day. You're just lazy. <laughs> There's nothing worse to call it. Like, you call somebody lazy. Like, I'm like, when you know, because I mean, there, are, there aren't that many people that are just flat out lazy. Like, you honestly can't afford to just be flat out lazy. But there aren't that many people who are flat out lazy. But, man, this, now we can tell them, hey, man, laziness out here killing people. <laughs> the venom in your voice <laughs> sounds like you have some history here, maybe with your parents. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm fine with that. Like, we, we not about that laziness. <laughs> Like, 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 just not, we not about laying in bed. My dad always say, you can't lay in bed counting your money all day. Like, we not, we not about that life. We about getting up and going. Like, I remember I was in college once. I let some friends stay with me, like, that week between graduate, uh, between end of class and graduation. You know, I had stuff to do that week. So I'd get up nine something, even not wake up at nine something, but I'd get up, go out. Man, I come back at one o'clock in the afternoon and it smelled like bad breath and cereal. Cause these cats are just sitting on the day. They, they, they just sitting at the table eating cereal at one o'clock in the afternoon and they ain't brushed their teeth or nothing yet. I'm like, y'all are lazy. Smelled like bad breath and cereal. Yeah, like, like why are y'all so lazy? Don't be lazy. <laughs> Oof. Oh, this brings a whole new level of ammunition for parents, does it now? Yeah, just stop being lazy. All right, this last story also comes from health. On December 9th, a volcano unexpectedly erupted on New Zealand's White Island, unleashing a torrent of superheated ash, gas, and steam onto dozens of unsuspecting tourists visiting for the day. At least 16 people died and dozens of others were severely burned. But when doctors went to treat them, they realized they were urgently short on one of the only supplies that could help, human skin. That's when a facility in southwestern Ohio stepped in. Community Tissue Services, a nonprofit tissue bank in Kettering, Ohio, packed hundreds of square feet of human skin into cardboard boxes lined with foam and dry ice and shipped them off to New Zealand, where burn surgeons were working 24 hours a day for nearly a week to treat all the unexpected patients. Skin is the largest organ on the human body, and when a patient suffers from more than 50% burns, doctors usually can't take skin from elsewhere on the patient's body to treat them with temporary grafts. But unlike other organs, skin donations from deceased donors are essentially universal. The donor and patient's blood type and ethnic background don't need to match because grafts are just a temporary cover that help the patient survive while their body tries to rejuvenate its own skin. In some cases, doctors even use pig and fish skin to cover severe burns. In the Ohio facility, skin donations are kept at extremely cold temperatures and have a shelf life of up to five years. Luckily, they had enough skin on hand to send to New Zealand. John Keneally, a leading doctor at an Auckland hospital, told reporters a few days after the eruption that his team expected to perform around 500 hours of surgery in the coming days and weeks. Yo, I had no idea that, like, the skin thing was happening like that. Word, yeah, I mean... It's insane. It's insane. I, I thought it's pretty cool yes. that you can use different skin grafts to kind of like temporarily service a bandage while the body gets itself right. It's also a little spooky. Yeah, it is definitely. Right. Like, but I imagine like if you wanted people getting that skin, it, it stopped being spooky to you a long time ago. Are you familiar with the uh, eruption that happened at White Island down there in New Zealand? No, it wasn't until I saw this story. Yeah, dude, nuts. Absolutely nuts. I read that it's the biggest tourist attraction in New Zealand. Oh, wow. And I actually went on that island when I was down there. Learn something new every day.
you went out there and it's like all this different level of activity and the islands basically you get beached up on there in like a little raft and then you walk around a little bit in the crater and it's like hissing and bubbling and all that sort of stuff but you don't think that it's going to blow up on you right there's like a pretty low level of activity i guess it had been raised up a little bit in the past couple of weeks but not enough to the point where they stopped doing tours out there Mm -hmm. and then just in the middle of the day a bunch of people are out there checking it out and it just blew up no that sounds miserable Hey, this is Bomani. You have reached the right time voicemail. Say whatever you want. Get creative with it. But this is your place to talk back to the show. So talk back. Peace. All right, Bo. Last voicemail segment of 2019. Here we are. Thought we'd uh, bring back an oldie but goodie. Why I quit football stories. We got a couple of good ones. Our first one comes from Ryan in Kansas. So my senior year of high school, um, I played on the line both ways. And on offense, I was a left tackle. And I'm six foot tall. I weighed about 220 pounds at the time. And during this one game, we had to play against a team that had this D lineman. Shoot, he was like 6'2", weighed 300 pounds. He ended up going D1, and he was also really agile, so he could play anywhere on the line. During this game, I mentioned that because he – seemed to go out of his way to embarrass each and every one of us that was on the line. And I remember, like, having to go in a couple of series later, see if I could stop this one man onslaught, seeing him on the other side of the line doing work, running through our guys. And next thing I know, he's lined up over me. And I'm sitting there like, okay, you know what, this guy's huge. He can't be that agile. I got a good pass pro. He's not getting past me on this play. Uh, but I was wrong. I was very, very wrong. You know, he ended up taking me right along with him to a nice little, like, 10-yard sack. What's crazy about it is that, like, you know how it looks when you see someone getting dragged along by a car. That's what it looked like, me trying to hang on to him. And to me, internally, it felt like, uh, you know, when you get toilet paper stuck on your shoe, to me, I felt like I was a minor inconvenience to this dude. And on top of that, almost half the time when he was getting into his stance, he would look right at us into our eyes and very calmly call out what our play call was and then blow it up. There's a few games we had to play after that, and I played them. You know, I tried to tough it out. But that moment when he first hit me was just demoralizing. I knew right then and there that football was no longer any fun. (laughs) Yo, the thing about these things is, do you think this guy we're talking about remembers this at all? Like, is it better if he does or doesn't remember it? Ooh, uh, I think it's better if he doesn't remember it. Because for the person that gets demoralized, it's good to not be remembered in that sense, maybe. Because it's, it's not like, oh, he's thinking back to the time when he ran me over. That's fair. I think that's fair. But this guy had some serious analogies. The toilet paper <laughs> on your foot <laughs> getting dragged. I got dragged by from a car. These last few guys didn't leave their names, but they're both pretty good. I played D1 ball. Um, about a buck seventy five play corner fast guy. So my school had the bright idea in the year of twenty ten, I believe, to invite the defending national champion, Alabama Crimson Tide, to come and play on our home field, I believe the second game of the year. So of course, you know, me being a freshman sophomore, you know, our whole team was jacked up, you know, thinking we're gonna shock the world. You know, mind you, this team has a defending Heisman Trophy winner, Mark Ingram. Future Heisman Trophy winner, Trent Richardson, was his backup. Had a young Quintoris Jones, otherwise known as Julio, on the outside. Dante Hightower going down the list, first round picks up and down the board. So it took about the third play of the game. And you quickly realize this is just a different breed of human, Bo. Like Ingram running the ball, stiff on my dudes into the ground, not breaking stride. Linebackers picking up our running backs and suplexing them. Julio Jones didn't get his jersey dirty the whole game because he was out of scoring but getting pushed out of bounds. So I'm sitting back like, whoa. So I played a lot of special teams. So what took the cake for me was in the second quarter, we kicked the ball off. I'm running down on kickoff. 
Trent Richardson fumbles the ball, drops the ball, so everybody breaks lane contain. He picks up the ball, takes off up the middle. I decide that I'm going to turn and try to catch him. Except when I turned, I seen a big cinder block wall at the corner of my eye for a split second coming to knock my block off. And that cinder block wall was wearing number 42 by the name of Eddie Lacy Bowl. <laughs> Third string running back, Eddie Lacy, blocking on special teams. Mind you, I was able to duck at the last second. That's why I'm still here talking to you today. But, Bo, when I got back to the locker room the next day, the day after that, yeah, I did a lot of research on the majors that my school offered, and I'm glad to say that I have picked a very safe and successful career as a businessman, emphasis on safe. So I'd like to thank the Alabama Crimson Tide uh, for directing me and bringing some clarity to my future career aspirations. So you played for Duke, huh? Yeah, he didn't mention what D1 school he played for. That sounds to me like he played for Duke um, in the way that he was describing this game, that Alabama schedule. They played Penn State in their second game, and they played Duke in the third game. And I have heard other stories about that Alabama-Duke game. This young man has nothing to be ashamed of. They were simply overmatched. And he went to go check out different majors to see what he was going to be <laughs> the next move in his life. Yes. Dude, good school, though. Good school to go to and uh, to yes. be able to make that pivot. Yes. All right, here's our last story. When I quit uh, my football season when I was playing Pop Warner ball back when I was about nine years old. So I grew up, if you know anything about Cali, I grew up in the Inglewood area. The football team that I played my first couple of years on with that, we did decent. Never made a championship, but, I mean, we was with. You know, I'm used to success. So I did move out to Orange County. Long story short, living out in the hood, we got robbed. Yeah, mom's isn't happening no more. She got us the F up out of there. So I'm playing on a team with one of my homeboys that lives out this way at Irvine. And basically the team's terrible, man. Like, a bunch of people, daddy's coaching the team. And, I mean, we just really had no organization. It really wasn't that great overall. I mean, it's a lot of white dudes on the squad. I don't hate on them, but, I mean, they just wasn't getting it better. Um, but neither was I, to be honest. But, anyway, I played that whole season on a team that we only, out of that 10-game season, only won one game. And the worst thing about it was not only was I playing on a team that only won one game, I wasn't even getting no close in time. I was what was called a must play, which means they had to put me in for one quarter of the game. Most of the time, it's going to be like the third or the fourth quarter. It was a fire position to be in. So I'm just going out every week getting beat down. And basically, they make every team go to the playoffs because, you know, young kids sports, but they want to let everybody have a moment. So you, you're going to make the playoffs even if you're terrible, but you're going to be a really bad team and play a really good team. So we play this team from Carson. When I tell you it was 31 to nothing before the first quarter ended, man, they was just doing whatever they wanted. There was no way that we was going to be up against this team and pull off no upset. So I remember literally, literally going to my mom during halftime, tell her I don't feel good. She said, what's wrong? I said, All right, I can't do it no more. I'm leaving. And she said, son, you, you're in the middle of the game. You can't do this. I said, mom, I haven't even played yet. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I took off my shoulder pads, put them in the trunk. So I gave my jersey to one of the homies. I was like, yo, this is it. I'm out. Mom, I don't feel good. Oh, that's the end. <laughs> I don't feel good. This is making me feel bad. A lot yes. of good commentary. I I love a good voicemail when a guy's doing stream of consciousness in, <laughs> in the car. Yeah, and he's clearly reliving this. Yeah. All right? Like, he's not just relaying it to us. He's going back in the moment so we knew where he was. Wow. But, hey, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. Thank you for joining us here in 2019. We do this thing a couple times a week. My man Gabe Bassane handles everything behind the scenes. 
Thank you, sir. Also, thank you to our sponsor, Lightstream. Also, thank you to our, if you haven't heard, contributors. Thanks to Julia Reese of Vice. Check out her story on how sleeping too much might give you a stroke at Vice.com. Also, thanks to Shabano Grady. Check out her story on the wide-ranging impact of the eruption at White Island in New Zealand at WashingtonPost.com. And thanks to Sean Grant of The Grio, who Gabe did not have a line name like our other contributors from The Grio had. They must not have sent him the memo. What do you mean I didn't have a line name? You know, like we had the like like Sojo and the People's Journalist, remember them? <laughs> yes. Sean didn't remember. have one. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't have a shout out there. Yeah, a little bit of a bummer. But you can still check out his story on Jay Z and Kanye reuniting at Diddy's birthday party at thegrio.com. Uh be sure to check out Mina Kime show featuring Lenny, her dog. Uh this week Mina chats with Field Yates and Himbo of Get Up. Uh to preview week sixteen. Download, subscribe to the Mina Kime show. Also subscribe to the right time. Rate us review us. Give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And we'll talk to you guys uh oh, in a couple of weeks, actually. A couple of days. No, we got one more. A couple of days. Take it easy. Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Right Time with Bomani Jones.